This media has been made available by Mosaic Boston Church. If you'd like to check out more resources, learn about Mosaic Boston, or donate to this ministry, please visit mosaicboston.com. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us life. We don't take that for granted. The fact that our hearts are beating, the fact that we're breathing, uh, is proof that our job isn't done. Our purpose has not been fulfilled. You still have much work for us to do. And I pray, Lord, that you ignite our hearts with a fiery passion, a zeal for you. A passion and a zeal that motivated Christ to enter the passion, the passion week. Where he was motivated by such a great love for God the Father and for the children that would be adopted into his household, those who would be saved, uh, that you, Jesus, went to a gory death and a crucifixion. And you did that because you were uh, moved, propelled, empowered by love. Show us today from the Holy Scriptures that uh, desire is at the very heart of our faith. Uh, how we believe, uh, well, it depends on how much we love. And I pray that you stoke our desire for you, give us a passion for you, a passion that is greater than any other passion. Uh, so our passion for you um, makes every other passion pale in comparison. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you move in our hearts today, move in this room now, teach us many things, reveal your truths to us and reveal your secrets to us. And Lord, continue to sanctify each one of us and continue to deepen our love for you and uh, our resolve to do whatever it takes uh, to show the world how majestic, uh, how great of a treasure uh, you are. Lord, bless our time in the Holy Scriptures. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we're continuing our sermon series through the Gospel of Mark called Kingdom Come. The Go Gospel of Mark and the secret of God's kingdom. And the title of the sermon today is Passionate Love. And at Mosaic, we're devoting the next two months, May and June, to immerse ourselves in the passion narrative as it's historically called, and that's Mark 14 and 15. And why is it called The Passion? The first time I even heard that was when the movie came out, The Passion of the Christ. Why is that uh, what Christ did in his final days, uh, his you know, crucifixion, his burial, his resurrection? Why is it called The Passion? When we think of passion, we think of art or music or hobbies or we think of the emotions surrounding intense love, devotion, or commitment. Or perhaps fits of violent anger or rage, which are called crime of passion. And if you look up the word passion in the dictionary, at the very bottom around the 11th possible definition, we find the passion of the Christ. And it's called the passion of the Christ because the word passion from the Latin, uh, patior, means to suffer, to bear, to endure. Uh, that Christ was willing to suffer whatever it took uh, because of his great passion, his great love for God and people. And I find this to be a powerful encapsulation of what happened during Holy Week. The God incarnate, the Son of God, motivated by his love for God and God's chosen, suffered the wrath of lawless men, and finally absorbed the wrath of a holy God. And he endured it all to save God's chosen people, the elect, from the wrath of a holy God that our unholy sins deserve. And this right here is love. This is passionate love. This is costly love. We find ourselves in the middle of Holy Week in the text. It's Wednesday morning. Wednesday morning, Jesus had taught in the temple. He established himself as the son of David. And then he quotes Psalm 110 to the Sanhedrin, who were the religious authorities. And he said, why does King David, the greatest king we ever had, have had why does he call the messiah lord the lord said to my lord and if david the great david called the messiah lord then the messiah along with being the son of david is also the son of god and as jesus revealed this to the sanhedrin uh, from the scriptures instead of falling to their knees and saying lord jesus we worship you you are you are god uh, we want to do everything we can to honor you instead they hatch a plot and they seethingly plan Jesus' murder. And knowing this was taking place behind the scenes, Jesus predicts the destruction of the second temple in Jerusalem, which was refurbished by Herod 
And Jesus warns his followers that as sure and as unexpected and as final as the destruction of the second temple was, so will the end times with the second coming of the Son of God. It's going to be as sure and as unexpected and as final. And since no one knows the exact date when Jesus is going to return, we must stay ready. And last week, Pastor Andy preached a powerful sermon uh, on the importance of steadiness and readiness, to, to be ready, to be ready that Christ might come back today or we might die today. Either way, we will meet with him or he might not return for another 10,000 years. As Conor McGregor used to say back when he was good, back in the day, he said, uh, I stay ready so I never have to get ready. And I think that's how we as believers need to think about the end times. We have to stay ready so we ne never have to get ready. And while Jesus was teaching in the temple and preparing his disciples for what was soon to come, the members of the Sanhedrin are scheming in the background. And uh, they know they can't arrest Jesus during the Passover. It's going to cause too much of a scene and the Roman uh, legions will retaliate. Uh, so they need some help. And in our text, they're about to get a boost from one of Jesus' disciples, from Judas. Uh, and Judas will betray his beloved Lord uh, and, and in doing so will fulfill um, prophecy. In Mark 14, the pace of the gospel begins to quicken and things take on a great sense of urgency. All of the things that Jesus said, all the things that he predicted for some time now about his betrayal, his arrest, his death, his resurrection are just hours away from fruition. In a literary sense, we're coming to the climax of the gospel narrative. In a redemptive historical sense, we're ab about to see the horrible yet wonderful events which lie at the very heart of the gospel. In a sense, we are approaching the holy ground of the holy scriptures by entering the passion narrative. Today we're in Mark 14, 1 through 11. Would you look at the text with me? It was now two days before the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. And while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment, pure of pure nard, very costly. She broke the flask and poured it over his head. And there were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. For you always have the poor with you and whenever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he sought an opportunity to betray him. This is the reading of God's holy, inerrant, infallible, authoritative word. May he write these eternal truths upon our hearts. Three points to frame up our time. Passionate for power, passionate for Jesus, and passionate for money. First, passionate for power. Uh, here in our text, we see a classic Markin sandwich, uh, which uh, in a, it's called this because the best part of the sandwich is always the stuff inside. That's the meat, the cheese, a little mayonnaise, a little impossible sauce from Trader Joe's, very tremendous. Lettuce, just for decorations. And then the bread, the bread is just to hold the, the delicious stuff inside. But Mark doesn't, Mark writes in such a way where, there, yes, there's a sandwich. On the one hand, you've got the bread of these men who hate God, who hate Jesus, and they want to use Jesus in order to get something, in order to get power, in order to get uh, money. And that's Ju the Sanhedrin, the scribes, and Judas. But in the middle... You have this story of a woman's incredible devotion to Jesus Christ. Uh, and Mark writes in such a way to show us the contrast. There's a stark contrast between these power-hungry religious authorities and a woman's love and devotion to Christ. And it ends with a man's love and devotion to, to money. The contrast between the darkness on the outside and the light and love on the inside couldn't be greater. 
And when Mark places two accounts of the Lord's betrayal around an account of conspicuous devotion to him, he's telling us something crucial, something truly important. He's showing us the difference between true faith and false faith. Faith, A true follower of Jesus Christ and a false follower of Jesus Christ. The true follower is one where their hearts are transformed. Their hearts are filled with gratitude, a sense of immense debt and love and devotion that must be acted upon because love is action. On the other hand, you have people that walk with Christ, take from Christ, and then sacrifice Christ to get something from him. A true disciple of Jesus Christ recognizes that Jesus is Lord. He is King of Kings. And what does she do? What does this woman do? She sacrifices greatly to anoint him, essentially saying, Jesus, I don't care what anyone else says about you. I know you're king and I know you are my king. I love and thank you for your passion. Here's my passion in return. I'm here to serve you. I exist to worship you. A false disciple never gets to the passionate service for Jesus because the false disciple believes that God exists for them. God exists to meet my needs. God exists to serve me. False disciples love Jesus as servant, but they balk at the thought that Jesus is king who jettisons us off the throne of our lives and takes a seat. That was the problem with Judas. Judas was with Jesus to get something from Jesus. As soon as he realized, I'm not going to get what I wanted from Jesus, I'm going to sell him. I'm going to betray him. That's false faith. Mark 14, 1, our text begins, it was now two days before the Passover and the feast of unleavened bread. Uh, the Passover was the famous holiday in remembrance of the night before the Lord brought uh, his people Israel out of captivity, out of Egypt and the Passover lamb and the blood of the Passover lamb, which was to cover the outside uh, doorway of the home, uh, that was to provide atonement for the people within. And uh, it was a, a crucial part of their faith system. And uh, the directions are given in Exodus 12, 5 through 13. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You may, t you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. And you shall keep it until the 14th day of this month, when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lambs at twilight. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted on the fire, with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but ro roasted its head and its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it, with your belt fastened, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it with haste. You shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I shall pass through the land of Egypt that night. And I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And on all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pa pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And Passover in the Greek is, is the word pascha. Uh, and if you've heard that word uh, in a different language, for example, and uh, in Russian, for example, the word pascha means Easter. So Russian believers, when they're, uh, I had a question from a Russian speaker, believer, and he's like, why is it called Easter? And I was like, yeah, that's a tremendous question. E the word Easter is a made-up word. We should be using the word Pascha, and today is actually uh, the Orthodox Easter. It's the Orthodox Pascha today. Uh, ours, the Protestant one, was March 31st. Now, I don't know who's in charge of this calendar. I wasn't invited into that room uh, I would say we should, have, we should be celebrating Pascha on the same day that the Passover is celebrated just to affirm to everyone uh, just how important it was that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, was crucified during the Passover. Uh, so Christians uh, did call initially Easter or Pascha uh, for centuries, and the adoption of the term uh, was 
uh, was important because of the closeness of the word Pascha to the Greek Paschain, which means to suffer. Uh, and we see in this text the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Originally, these were two separate holidays, but they merged together in Old Testament times. So this likely places Judas' act of betrayal and Jesus' anointing for his burial at some point on Wednesday, uh, since the Passover of Pascha was celebrated between sundown and midnight in two days. Mark 14, 1, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to arrest him by stealth and kill him. And the chief priests and the scribes, these are supposed to be the leaders of their religion. They're supposed to know the law more than anyone else. And they're supposed to abide by the law of God, the Ten Commandments, and teach the law to others. And those who seemingly were concerned about Jesus being a lawbreaker are now plotting to kill him in direct violation of every law they claim to uphold. And they want to do it by stealth and kill him. Why? Because they understand that if we make this a public transaction and the crowd is not with us, uh, there will be an uproar and it will uh, bring uh, down the ire of Rome. Mark 14, 2, that's what they said. Not during the feast, lest there be an uproar from the people. And the word here in the Greek for uproar isn't just some kind of protest or demonstration. It's a full-scale, out-of-control rampage, uh, which would lead to Roman retaliation. Uh, the Passover attracted not just spiritual pilgrims, but also patriotic pilgrims. It was a patriotic holiday uh, for the people. So Jerusalem swelled in population uh, fourfold during the holiday. They wanted to kill him, but they wanted to do it in a way where they don't lose their power. And they wanted, and they understand that the only way to do that is... Uh, to do it by stealth. And of course, the Jewish leader's intention is thwarted. Uh, the opposite of what they wanted happened. They wanted to execute Jesus in silence by stealth. Instead, he's executed on the first day of the Passover, the most important day, the, the day when Jerusalem was filled with people like uh, no other day of the year. So uh, the Jewish authorities, their hand was forced by the events and ultimately by God himself. God overruled with his providence their political designs. And the betrayal of our Lord took place much earlier than they wanted. And the death of our Lord took place on the very day when Jerusalem was most full of people. When the Passover feast was at its height. And here uh, many a lesson uh, can be drawn. Uh, but God takes the wrath of man, the wrath of these sinful people, uh, and he turns their wickedness upon them, turned it into foolishness. They thought they were going to bring an end to Christ's kingdom. They thought by crucifying him, they're going to make him vile and contemptible for who would worship a God who was crucified. And instead, they made Jesus Christ the object of our worship. They thought if they put him to death secretly without notice, uh, everything would end. Instead, uh, they crucify him publicly before the eyes of the whole nation of the Jews, which ultimately is one of the reasons why when the apostles filled the spirit, start preaching in Jerusalem, thousands start coming to faith immediately because they said, we were eyewitnesses. We saw the whole thing. Obviously, he's the Passover lamb. He was crucified on the Passover. Psalm 76.10 says, Surely the wrath of man shall praise you. The remnant of wrath you will put on like a belt. So even the wrath of, of people against God, God turns around uh, into glory. Psalm 2, a messianic psalm says this. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. Against the Lord and against his anointed. Saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. And the Lord holds them in, in derision. The religious authorities thought they were in a power struggle just with a man, uh, Jesus of Nazareth. And from their worldly perspective, this man who claimed to be the Messiah, who claimed to be the Son of God, the worst possible time to kill a man like this, a man whose predecessor, John the Baptist, who was revered by everyone, of the time, they knew that he was a prophet of God. John the Baptist's testimony about Jesus, the very first time he sees him is, that's the Lamb of God. That's the Lamb of God who's come to take away the sins of the world. 
So this guy who has been called the Lamb of God by a guy who everyone viewed as a prophet, the absolute worst time to crucify this Lamb of God would be when the lambs are being crucified for Passover. If Jesus were killed on the Passover, that would make him the suffering servant of Isaiah 53 who was led to the slaughter. And that's what he was. That's what he is. Isaiah 53, 6 and 7. All we... Like sheep have gone astray, we have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent. So of course the sovereign God of the universe overrules their machinations and leads them to do the very thing that they tried to prevent. And this reveals, it's supposed to reveal to them as well. That you're not just in the power struggle with a man. You're in the power struggle with God. And any power and struggle with God, you will always lose. Um, and the struggle is futile. And of course, this isn't a coincidence. With God, there's no such thing as coincidence. God is sovereign. There's no such thing as coincidence. That on the very day the Passover lamb was slain, the lamb of God was crucified and uh, it, it was all done intentionally to, to open up the eyes of the Jewish people. That this, this Passover holiday that you have been celebrating for centuries, it was meant to point you to a greater Passover lamb. In the same way that the Passover preceded the Exodus, we need a Passover lamb to die for us to precede our Exodus from Satan, sin, and ultimately Death. A uh, Passover, the holiday, was supposed to be, a, in the words of Paul, the schoolmaster unto Christ, as Galatians says. Uh, the Passover was meant to remind the Jews, yes, of the Exodus, yes, that God did save those whose homes were covered by the blood, and, but it's supposed to point to a greater blood, a blood that d doesn't just protect us from uh, the angel of death, but a blood that cleanses us from sin and everything. That, that comes with. Uh, so here we are to remark and we are to uh, be moved by the beauty of divine providence of the sovereign God at work. How perfectly it all happened. At the very perfect time, everything is just brought together for this to happen. Romans 5, 6 puts it like this. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. At the right time. At the precise, precisely right time. Uh, this moment that was set before the foundation of the world uh, it has come. And all the human and demonic machinations to prevent this from happening on God's timetable were all squelched. Uh, this brings us to point two. is passionate for Jesus. We move from the commotion of the public sphere into an intimate scene in a home. It's a meal. And the home is outside of Jerusalem and Bethany. In verse 3, while he was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leper... As he was reclining at table, a woman came with an alabaster flask of ointment of pure nard, very costly, and she broke the flask and poured it over his head. Uh, the story is repeated in the Gospel of Matthew and also the Gospel of John, but this story is not to be confused with the story in the Gospel of Luke, where another woman who was called a sinner also comes and also anoints Jesus with ointment. But she doesn't just anoint his head, she also anoints his feet and uh, with tears and her hair, uh, she wipes his feet. Uh, and the fact that uh, this happened at least twice in the life of Jesus, in the life of his ministry, that two different women, throwing caution and social decorum to the wind, uh, making a spectacle of themselves in some sense, um, they do this as an act of de declaring their love and gratitude for Jesus. And in the story in Luke 7, Jesus explicitly draws attention to the fact that uh, this woman is motivated by love. And she's motivated by a great love for Christ because he has forgiven her of her sins. He has freed her from the cruel bondage of her sinful past. Uh, she loves much because she has been forgiven much. Uh, and remember what Jesus said to the complaining homeowner on that occasion. He who has been forgiven little, loves little. Uh, and this woman here uh, is most likely Mary, uh, according to John 12. Mary, the sister of Martha and the sister of Lazarus. 
So yes, she, she knows that Jesus is going to die for her sins. She's moved by gratitude for that, uh, about that. But she's also moved with gratitude for the fact that Jesus brought her brother back from the dead. And she has been looking for an occasion to honor the Lord, show him and convey the depth of her feelings and her immense gratitude. Uh, so what does she do? Uh, she goes through the options. What can I do for him? What does he need? Uh, he's at a meal, so he doesn't need food. Uh, he, to- he said he's about to die. What does he need? And she's moved by the Spirit to take the most expensive thing, most likely, that she owned, a jar of perfume. And careless of its value, the amount of money it represented, or better, precisely because it was so expensive, she poured all of it over the Lord. Uh, like Psalm 116 verse 12 says, this is the posture of heart that she's moved with. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? And that's a, that's a very important question. And in prayer this week, pray over this verse. What, what benefits has the Lord given me? And there are so many. Once you start counting, once you start thinking, the immensity of the benefits, well, what shall I render, Lord, in Return Not because this is how I earn anything from you, but because you have done everything. You have paid it all. I, and now I, I want to give myself wholeheartedly to you. Jesus is in the house of a gentleman named Simon the leper. Uh, most likely he had been healed by this point because had he not been healed, he would still be quarantined uh, from the people isolated to keep others from getting the dreaded disease. And... Uh, Jesus here, it says he's reclining at table. In Old Testament times, people ate by sitting, but under Greek influence. uh, In the richer households in Palestine where they could afford the dining couches, uh, they would at feasts uh, recline. Uh, I I like that posture of Jesus. Uh, I've never seen it drawn, but Jesus is chilling uh, on dining couches, just having a good time. Uh, That's the situation. And then a woman comes in. Uh, John 12 specifies that this truly is Mary, the sister of Lazarus, and Martha. So there are a possible 20 people in the, in the home, the 12 disciples, Jesus, Simon the leper, Mary, Martha, Lazarus, and perhaps some other members of Simon's uh, immediate family. In an earlier story, if you remember in Luke, uh, Martha and Mary had invited Jesus and the 12 disciples over for a meal and the meal wasn't ready, and everyone's having a Bible study except for Martha. Martha's in the kitchen cooking. And then Martha had enough, and she comes to the Lord, she's exasperated. She says, Lord, uh, do not care that my sister is doing nothing. She nothing, there's no love for you in my sister. Uh, and Jesus points to her and he says, she, she's doing the most important thing. She's listening to my words. And most likely, she heard from the Lord her, uh, herself that he said, I'm going to die. I am on my way to die. I am the Passover lamb. If I do not die, then when people die in their sins, there's no, there's no atonement for this. I have to die. I am uh, the lamb of God. And she, she took him at his word. She understood exactly what was happening. Uh, and from that moment onwards, she might have been thinking, how can I demonstrate to Jesus that I truly love him, that I truly understand what he's come to do for me? So she takes an alabaster flask of ointment. The flask itself was valuable, and it holds something even more valuable, ointment of pure nard, very costly. Uh, And the word ointment is used. It's not just perfume. Uh, Most ancient perfumes were oil-based, unlike modern perfumes, which are alcohol-based. And the fattier the base, the more stable the perfume. Uh, Nard is an oil Extract, extract from a root uh, that grew in India. So she, she takes a, probably the heirloom. And you say, where did she get this? Later on, the disciples are like, that's 300 denarii. And if you do the math, one denarii was what a man got paid for manual labor for one day's work. So if you take out 52 Sabbaths in the year, a few days off of the festivals, they were expected to work 300 days or so. Uh, 300 denarii, that's a lot of money. That's a year's wages for a man. So where did she get this um, thing? Where did she get this money? Perhaps it was an heirloom. Who knows? But most likely this is, this is the most um, uh, 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 expensive thing she owns. And what does she do? She breaks the flask. 
She breaks the alabaster jar. She breaks the narrow neck, meaning it's irreparable. You break it, you have to use all of it. It's irreparable, so what she's about to do is irreversible. She's all in. Uh, commentators generally assume that the breaking of the jar's neck was a common practice, but no archaeological or literary evidence supports this. No, uh, people would, would, they would never break the neck. Uh, they would stopper it with a piece of cloth or parchment or papyrus, and they would use the potent, potent perfume drop by drop, never like this. And the woman's breakage of the jar allows the perfume to flow out in a greater quantity than usual. She pours it over his head, it says. She pours the whole thing. Uh, and Jesus is sitting there reclining at a table. All of a sudden there's liquid coming down. Uh, the room is consumed with uh, wonderful aroma. And what is she doing here? Uh, does she know she's anointing him for burial? Does she think she's anointing him as a king or as a priest or as the Messiah, as we see in the Old Testament? We're not told. Uh, Jesus had already been anointed as the Messiah on his baptism when the Holy Spirit descended upon him. God the Father spoke, this is my son in whom I delight and whom I'm well pleased. So now Jesus, who has been anointed by the Spirit, is anointed uh, with this oil. What's the response of the people in the room? Verse 4. There were some who said to themselves indignantly, why was the ointment wasted like that? And the sum in John 12 is made clear that the sum were led by Judas. And it says that Judas, who was the treasurer, but he was also a thief. Judas was such an exemplary disciple that the disciples, when they said, you know what, we need a treasurer. Who do you think it should be? Should it be Peter? Nah. <laughs> Too impetuous. Uh, should it be John and James? No way. You guys want to call down thunder on everyone and kill everyone. No, not you guys. So they look at uh, Judas and they're like, God, that's the most exemplary guy. That guy, that's, that is a quintessential disciple of Jesus Christ, that guy. And Judas, he, he was indignant uh, by this, and he led this charge because he wanted to steal. He, he wanted to steal from the, the treasury bag. And he thought, oh my goodness, 300 denarii? You spent 300 denarii in the one fell swoop on Jesus Christ? Like if you do the math, one year's wages, even if you, like out of college, your first job, if you think about one year's wages, it's like around 50 grand. Imagine $50,000 just poured out on Jesus Christ. And what do they say? That was a waste. What a waste this was. Why was the ointment wasted like this? Um, to them, it was, it was a waste. Uh, and and for, for Judas, uh, you can just think of how he did the math in his, in my 300 denarii, Jesus, you're not worth that. You're not worth that. You're worth a lot less than 300 denarii. And, and Judas actually, he had it quantified in his mind what Jesus was worth. Later on, he sells Jesus Christ for, three, for 30 pieces of silver, the price of a slave. Why was the ointment wasted like that? Mark 14, 5, for this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and given to the poor. Uh, and the language here is very emotive. It's very powerful. They scolded her, it says, uh, um, in the language, they snorted at her like a horse snorts, uh, glowered at her. Uh, she's doing a, a wonderful thing to the Lord, and uh, she's getting criticism in return. Verse 6, and Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. Uh, her passionate sacrifice, her costly act of love, Jesus deems beautiful. They think it's a waste. Jesus says it's beautiful. There's only one opinion that matters, and that's of Christ. And there are moments in life where the Holy Spirit does move you to do something like this for the Lord. Something that doesn't make sense to the world. Something where, with, according to the world, reckless abandon, you go all in for the Lord. And at those moments, those are very precious moments, those are very holy moments, when the Lord does lead you uh, there... Uh, do not be slowed down by the criticism of the people uh, who begin to calculate in a very calculating way uh, that Jesus is not worth this sacrifice. You no, know, focus on Jesus. Jesus sees and Jesus says, that's beautiful. I remember when the Lord called me into ministry. I was a couple of years out of college and I knew that the Lord had his, 
hand and calling and anointing upon me. And I, I remember uh, I told someone really close to me, I said, I think I'm going all in. I'm, 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 I'm quitting this trajectory in life. I'm going on the trajectory to preach the word. I'm going all in on seminary uh, because I, I believe that was important. Uh, I, don't, I wouldn't go to a doctor that says, you know what, I don't have a degree, but uh, I learned online my skill set. I'm like, no, thank you. I wouldn't do that with a lawyer either. I don't, I don't do that with a pastor. And so I remember telling the person, I'm quitting my job. I'm going to seminary. And the person looked me in the eyes and they said, what a waste. What an absolute waste. You just spent four years in an Ivy League institution. You got racked up all this debt. And then you're going to go become a pastor. You're going to preach the word. What a waste. And at moments like that, you say, yeah, mm -hmm. your opinion mm -hmm, it doesn't matter very much. There's only one opinion that matters most. And that's the opinion of Jesus Christ. Jesus deems the sacrifice beautiful. And he defends the woman from critics and the critics turn out to be his disciples. Mark 14, 7, for you always have the poor with you and whatever you want, you can do good for them. But you will not always have me. What's Jesus doing here? He's setting himself above the needs of humanity. He puts himself in a completely different category. Because he is in a different category. He's not just human, he's God himself. And this right here is a test. It's a test. How do you react to the woman's actions. If you were in the room, would you be closer to Judas and the disciples or closer uh, to Jesus understanding what's happening here? Do you think Jesus is worth this sacrifice? Do you think this, Jesus is worth this incredible um, act of gratitude? Uh, and if not, if not, perhaps you don't really know who Jesus is. He's not just a prophet. He's not just a teacher. Uh, he's our savior. Uh, he's our God and he's our king. Um, and do you see what else the story is saying? The story here is saying that uh, Jesus is worthy of something like this because Jesus is worthy of worship. That's what this is. This isn't just her giving an incredible gift to a man. It's, it's, it, she understands who this is. Uh, I remember a brother one time, I forget what it was, Christmas or something, a brother bought me cologne. And uh, I had never had another man buy me cologne. Uh, but you know what? Uh, I, I appreciated it. Because I found out later, my wife showed, she's like, she went online, she's like, you know how much this cologne costs? I was like, how much? She's like, $500. And uh, I was like, $500? That's terrible. Oh, that sounds nice. Yeah, oh, that, that. And... Um, uh, I think there's something biblical about smelling nice. It's in the text. Uh, you should smell nice. We should be a uh, fragrant aroma of Christ. We should also smell nice. Um, but this isn't her giving cologne to a man. This is her anointing the Son of God. This is her worshiping Jesus as God. And that's why Jesus says it's not wasteful, it's beautiful. He expects our worship. He doesn't just accept the worship, he expects it. Verse 8, she has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for burial. She's done what she could. Uh, she performed the only service within her power. And that's the same phrase that Jesus uses when he looked at the widow throwing the pennies into the treasury. And he says she has given more than everyone else combined because she has done everything she could. Uh, she has done what she uh, could. Uh, these two examples of humble, self-giving women serving the Lord form a stark contrast to the greedy and destructive actions of the men in the text. Uh, what the disciples said about the value of the ointment and the need of the poor was perfectly true. And Jesus uh, is showing that, yes, we are to give. We are to uh, give to the poor and care for the poor. Uh, but we are not to forget that uh, Jesus is in the category greater. He deserves more. Uh, and Jesus says, she has anointed my body. The Old Testament practice in which oil is poured over the head of a person or to indicate their consecration to kingship or to the priesthood uh, was well known. Uh, is that why she's anointing him? No, Jesus says, she's anointing me for burial. She, she knows what she's doing. Jesus knows what she's doing. She's preparing his body for uh, burial, and uh, we, we must not forget that service 
to Christ does take precedence over service to people. And we are to serve people, but we do it in the name of Jesus Christ, even with children. And I think this is important to keep things in perspective, uh, parents, as you raise your children. Uh, you, your life does not revolve around this child. You are not serving this child primarily for this child. You are serving this child for Christ, in the name of Christ. So that's why raising a child, it is ministry. It's service to the Lord. Mark 9, 37, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. And in a sense, she had given to the poor. Because Jesus Christ, for our sakes, though he had been rich, eternally rich, became poor uh, to save us. Uh, And she uh, here does everything she can to anoint his body, prepare his body for burial While Martha was busy preparing a meal for the hungry disciples, Mary was seated at Jesus' feet, listening to everything he was saying intently and believing it. Uh, Luke 10, 38 through 42. Now as they went on their way, Jesus entered a village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, 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 you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. The disciples still didn't get it. Judas definitely didn't get it. But this woman got it, that Jesus was going to die in the place of sinners like her. And by the way, this is the only anointing that Jesus got. If you remember in Mark 16, on the first morning of Resurrection Sunday, uh, the women are going to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body, and the body wasn't there. Uh, This is the only anointing that Jesus got, and it was a very powerful ointment. Most likely that smell stayed with Jesus. It stayed with him as he was on trial. It stayed with him as he was being beaten, as he was being scourged, as the crown of thorns was, was hammered into his head. He smelled it. It was this mixture of sweat, blood, and this ointment. And he smelled it as he was being crucified on the cross as a reminder for whom he was doing what he was doing. And then Jesus says this about this extra- extravagant, beautiful act, Mark 14, 9. And truly I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. Just like it's happening today. Why? Because she is the perfect example of what happens when you truly understand what Jesus did for you. That he poured out his Passover Lamb of God blood, all of it, generously. And he gave all that he had to save you. So we are to give him all that we have to serve him. And then point three is passionate for money. This is verse 10. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to... Betray him to them. There's a struggle taking place in this text at the very dinner party, uh, in this candlelight supper. There's a struggle. And it's not just between the disciples and the woman. It's not just between Judas and the woman. And it's not just between the Sanhedrin and the woman. Uh, It's between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. It's that ancient struggle. It's the struggle that we see back in Genesis 3. And it's emerging here again. The dragon is here, Satan is here, and he's entering the heart of Judas. And we must know, whenever you want to do a beautiful thing for the Lord, something this sacrificial, you will be attacked by Satan. And sometimes the attack comes through someone who looks just like the other disciples. And we are to be aware of that reality. Uh, Do you know what was the final straw for Judas? What pushed him over the edge? It was the sight of $50,000 being poured on Jesus' head. And at that moment, he was thinking to himself, imagine what I could have done with that. Uh, Mark 14, 11, when they heard it, they were glad and promised to give him money. And he saw an opportunity to betray him. Matthew 26, 15 records that uh, the clergy gave Judas 30 silver pieces, substantial sum and the traditional purchase price of a slave. And in the Matthew dialogue... Uh, he says, uh, he says the, this is what he said, well, what are you willing to give me? What are you going to give me? Uh, and he handed Christ over. Uh, Passover being the patriotic time of the year, 
Uh, and the Romans uh, were taking extra security precautions. So they needed Judas. They needed Judas to lead them at night to Gethsemane and point Christ out. Uh, and he was willing to do it. Uh, and just think about uh, the blessings that Judas got. Uh, he was chosen by the Lord himself. He got to walk with Jesus Christ for three years. He saw the miracles. He heard the sermons. He preached sermons himself. He cast out demons in Jesus' name. He worked with Peter, James, and John. And it turns out that the whole time he was a false-hearted child of the devil. He didn't want... Christ, he wanted what Christ could give him. Never was there such a fall, such an apostasy, such a miserable end to such a promising beginning, such a total eclipse of the soul. And how can this, how can his behavior be explained? What motivated him? What was he passionate about? He was passionate about money. The love of money was the cause of this man's ruin. And the same groveling covetousness which enslaved the heart of Balaam and brought on Gehazi's uh, leprosy. Uh, this was the destruction of Judas Iscariot's soul. It's just, it's just that plain. He loved God. He loved money more than God. And he wanted to use God, sacrifice God for his money. Uh, John 12, 4 through 6, but Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he, was, he who was about to betray him said, why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Luke 12.15, the words of Christ, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. So Judas was seeking for an opportunity to betray Jesus, and that opportunity overlapped with the opportunity that the Sanhedrin was looking for, and it overlapped with the timing of the Lord. Uh, so Judas goes and plots and betrays the Lord. Uh, the last word in verse 11 is crucial, verse 11b, and he sought an opportunity to betray him, uh, to give him over. Uh, and that same word, that word is crucial because that same word is used to describe the actions of the Lord. Romans 8, 31 and 32. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also with him graciously give us all things? God the Father gave his son up for us. The same word that's used for betray. Uh, Judas did it to betray. God the Father did it to provide a means of salvation for us. Uh, so we are to see that it's not just Judas at work here. Uh, we see the divine providence of God. God's bringing his purpose of redemption to fullness and to a climax. He's handing over his own beloved son for the likes of this woman, for the likes of you and me. And this woman sees it. She grasps the gospel and she pours out her love and her affection to Jesus. While Jesus is teaching the twelve on the Mount of Olives, the Sanhedrin is plotting to kill him. While Mary is showing her devotion to Jesus and unknowingly or knowingly anointing Jesus for his death and burial, Judas is providing the Sanhedrin with everything uh, to betray him. Judas will betray the Savior and lead the Sanhedrin to Jesus so that he might be arrested. And in these parallel plot lines, we are to see the reality of the promise of God to turn evil into good. Jesus knew what lay ahead. He predicted it. He allowed Mary to anoint him for his burial because he knew he was going to die. Jesus chose Judas to be one of the twelve, even though he knew that Judas was a devil, because Jesus knew that such a betrayal would set into motion events that would take him to the cross and then to the empty tomb. Jesus' suffering and humiliation now reaches zenith, and Jesus endured all of this to save us from our sins. So never forget that Jesus endured all of this for us, for you. 
And can you, like this woman, go to Jesus and say, yes, you're my savior. Yes, you are. You're my king. And whatever you call me a sacrifice, I'm willing to do it. A few closing words before we transition to communion. If you've ever been, if you've ever been rejected by friends or family, Jesus knows all about that. His own people, the Jews, his own family who thought he was crazy. And the shepherds of Israel who accused him of even worse things. They all rejected him. And if you've ever been betrayed by someone close to you, well, Jesus has too. And he knows the sting of such betrayal. And for those who are even now suffering, Jesus knows exactly what you're going through. And he suffered more than any one of us ever will. And yet, despite the betrayal, despite the rejection, despite the suffering and the humiliation, Jesus knew that God would turn all of this to good. Romans 8, 28, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. Jesus Christ loves you with passion, and we are to love God with passion in return. At this time, we're going to transition to celebrating Holy Communion. Uh, Jesus Christ commanded that we celebrate communion to remember him, to remember his act of suffering on the cross to save us. Uh, for whom is communion? It is for repentant believers in Jesus Christ. So if you are not a follower of Christ, if you don't believe, uh, we ask that you refrain from this part of the service so it won't do anything for you. Uh, instead, we do call you to repent. We call you to repent of your sins and Put your faith in Christ, the Passover Lamb of God. And if you do, you're welcome to partake. Uh, and then if you uh, consider yourself a believer and you are living in known unrepented sin, don't part partake. Uh, this will actually do more harm than good, according to 1 Corinthians 11. Uh, instead, repent. And if you do repent, you're welcome to uh, partake. Uh, if you haven't received the elements and you'd like to participate in Holy Communion, uh, please raise your hand. And as I pray, the ushers will uh, bring them to you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the passion of Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are worthy of our worship. And we wor worship you with all that we have. We pray that we live lives commensurate to your great passion for us. Uh, stoke our hearts with a zeal and a passion for you. And Lord, right now as we meditate upon your sufferings on the cross, we take time to repent of our sins. Uh, and we do this uh, with contrition of heart, knowing that we have broken your holy law, and we have broken your commandments, and we've broken your heart. And we repent of our sin, we repent of pride, we repent that often our desires for power or money or whatever, are greater than our passion for you. And I pray, Lord, reorder our passions, reorder our desires even now. And Lord, as we meditate upon your sufferings on the cross, when your body was truly broken, it was broken to heal us, to provide healing for our souls. And your blood was shed and it was shed in order to sanctify us, in order to cleanse us from shame and guilt. And we thank you for that cleansing. We receive that cleansing uh, by grace through faith right now. Bless our time and Holy Communion, and we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, if you uh, are partaking communion for the first time with us, there are two lids. If you open the top, it opens the cup. If you open the bottom, it opens up the bread. On the night that Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took the bread, and after breaking it, he said, this is my body, broken for you. Take, eat, and do this in remembrance of me. He then proceeded to take the cup, and he said, This cup is the cup of the new covenant of my blood, which is poured out for the sins of many. Take, drink, and do this in remembrance of me. Heavenly Father, in the same way that you anointed your son Jesus Christ with the Holy Spirit, in the same way that you sealed us on the day of our repentance and regeneration with the Spirit, 
I pray, Lord, that you anoint us with a spirit of fresh anointing. And anointing is only possible through great breaking, just like the alabaster flask. The neck had to be broken for anointing to come. And, Lord, we know that with great anointing, a great breaking precedes it. And, Lord, as we ask for anointing upon this church, as we ask for anointing upon ourselves, uh, we recognize that suffering is part and parcel with that anointing. Just like we saw Jesus, Jesus, you were anointed, and Jesus, you were crucified. And yet we still ask for that anointing, an anointing that uh, would allow your name to be glorified and people to be persuaded and compelled uh, by the gospel. Uh, and Lord, by the power of the Spirit, give us opportunities this week and uh, continue to give us opportunities to share the good news of Jesus Christ uh, for all who would turn from sin, all who would turn to the Lord, all who would turn to Jesus as King. All their sins are forgiven and their eternity is secure. And Lord, I pray that you give us those opportunities. Continue to draw your elect and continue to use us in the process and continue to build up your kingdom here and beyond. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.